So I didn't come from college to university, you know, I, I sort of started a family first and then I did a course in counselling psychology after I did my bachelor's. And I suppose throughout my bachelor's degree I met various individuals who were counselling psychologists and I liked their style, their way of expressing themselves, their, the way they thought about the client. I thought that fits with the way I would like to work therapeutically with, with people. And I suppose that's always sat with me. And then after I finished my um, bachelor's degree, oh, just before I finished my bachelor's degree, I moved here from Leeds to London and um, then did a short module in counselling psychology run by Birkbeck uh, University and then really got a, a good sense of what the um, top, what the profession is about and that really cemented my interest, my passion for it and my determination to actually get on the master's course at London Guildhall University and I was one of the, um, I think it was about 18 of us, the first cohort um, there at uh, Guildhall. I work primarily in a community mental health team for older people at the Woodland Centre in Hillingdon, um, on the same site as Hillingdon Hospital. Um, I work in a multidisciplinary team made up of psychiatrists, occupational therapists, community psychiatric nurses, support workers, um, admiral nurses who work with um, older people who have dementia and their families. So a wide range of um, colleagues. Um, my main role is to deliver psychological therapy. And due to the complexity and comorbidity that lies within this particular client group, I find that there's, there's just so much to balance, not just their physical health, but how that impacts on their mental health and the other way around. And older people present with the, the usual things that um, adults present with, psychosis, depression, anxiety, negative life events, um, bereavement, all sorts of different things. But I suppose what's different for older people is that within the context of being an older person, it's slightly a different way of experiencing life and having a specialist service that can meet their needs and really understand what's going on for, for them is actually very, um, very important. What I find enjoyable about working with older people is that it, it's so varied and it surpasses my expectation. So often when working with older people, because you're constantly having to, I suppose it sounds obvious, you know, you're constantly having to think. Of course, psychologists do that quite a bit. Um, that's the core of their work. But I suppose with older people, they always, I'm always learning from them. I, you know, they're teaching me something. They come from a generation that is rich with wisdom. So I find that coming to a session and not always being the expert, I can do that. And I find that that works best in developing a therapeutic relationship. And then the work becomes much more collaborative. It's dependent on what the members want. You know, so I receive a lot of email communication from members who want advice about a variety of different things. For instance, training routes, um, advice about where, what the d division strategy is for the forthcoming year, um, whether um, issues around neuropsychology, issues around recruitment, um, issues by recruitment by competence, and also issues about, um, like recently, you know, inequality in pay. For instance, I had something about that. So as part of my role, I sit on a variety of different committees which will perhaps cover some of those um, issues and where I don't have the expertise to answer the questions usually a member of the executive committee of the division usually has the answer who can give some guidance around that and I suppose that's what's brilliant about being a chair is that it's not just about me it's about 
the, the executive committee and it's about all the members really, you know, and knowing that there's such a diverse talent out there that I can tap into and if I don't know who they are, I can ask someone who can connect me with them. I also find that as chair I get invited to a lot of things. So recently I was invited to the Division of Occupational Psychology conference. I was asked to take part in a chair, chair's panel um, discussing social justice. And it was really interesting. So that was made up of the BPS president, um, myself, um, Pam James, um, also um, David um, Webster, who's the chair of the coaching division and also Roxane Gervais, who's now vice chair of um, um, the Division of Occupational Psychology. And although it was small numbers in the room, it really felt that um, some of the debate that was generated be uh, from the question that was posed, how can um, psychologists or how can the BPS actively, you know, develop a, you know, the just position, you know, do the right thing, I suppose, in relation to social justice issues that are coming up right now. It, it brought out a lot. And I, we had to give a four minute introduction about ourselves, about our perspectives, our philosophy. And, you know, because we had to stick to time, it was, um, I, I read something about myself, which I thought, I didn't know how that would be received. Um, which I wanted to give some insight into how I feel about the way the world is changing. Um, and it, it seemed to go down quite well. I think everyone brought something really important to the um, table. Some of the main challenges I found as a counselling psychologist is about regarding recognition. Um, I come with a particular set of skills, but in today's um, climate I often find where it's very competitive, I suppose, in lots of different organisations, often people compare. So they compare one professional group against another rather than appreciating the competences that a particular um, group of psychologists might bring. So I've had to, um, I suppose, really defend myself quite a bit. And that's been really difficult. Um, not within, I suppose, the colleagues that I work with, these are not the issues that I have with the colleagues that I work with. And I work alongside counselling psychologists and clinical psychologists, and we do similar work, and we just work together very, very well. But I find that those that are in positions of power where they can make these kinds of assumptions in regard to who to recruit or who fits bet best where, these are where I'm coming up with the, with the barriers. And what I've found um, has been helpful is where it's an employment issue, I found Unite to be very helpful in helping me navigate through some of those legal um, policy issues that I might not be aware of. I've also found that having a really good support network where I work is actually extremely important. So colleagues to support me through that in a kind of very warm and emotional way because it can, can really um, impact you know, when one is being treated differently. Um, and I've also found that it is really important to have a very um, deep and um, con deep connection with your professional body so that you're in line with whatever their position is because that also gives you some kind of support. Because often when you're in positions like that, you can feel very alone. Um, so I found that that's really helped me and maybe in overcoming those challenges has helped me feel more confident about, you know, take it be, being on the um, executive committee and then thinking, oh, I'll go for chair and see how that is. I suppose we learn through the challenges, don't we? That's how you grow as a, as a psychologist and as a person. 
And I suppose often when I found it most difficult and I've thought, well, you know, I've really questioned things quite a bit. Um, not so much my identity, but why, you know? Because often it feels really unnecessary um, to give people a hard time, you know? And it, it just makes me think about how people use their power and often in abusive ways, really. And sometimes they're not aware of it. I genuinely think that sometimes people do things unintentionally, um, but with a bit more awareness and sensitivity, one, you can learn and adjust one's behavior in relation to whoever you're dealing with, about whatever issue you're dealing with. The profession has, um, doesn't really put up any restrictions about how you develop. You come from a very organic, natural place. So I came to counselling psychology because I observed other counselling psychologists, their style, their way of being. It just felt really real, very human. And although everything that they talked about was couched in evidence-based practice, they still managed to come from that very ordinary, everyday place. And that's what I like. That's what attracted me. And what I like about still feeling proud to be a counselling psychologist is that hopefully I've managed to retain that. You know, I'm, I say ordinary, but ordinary is, it's okay. It's okay just to be ordinary, not in a kind of pejorative sense, but in just a very chilled out, cool way. Working uh, in a multidisciplinary team is really interesting. It can also be challenging as well because obviously you have so many different perspectives. Everyone is trained from a, t uh, a different model. So, and the medical model is, dominates quite a bit, especially in, in older people services because of the physical health um, difficulties and because usually the responsible clinician it is the psychiatrist, the consultant psychiatrist. So that really leads a lot of the discussions. But I find that when I try to bring in a psychological perspective, it's, it is often heard and, and it's fine that people might disagree but it's important that everyone's voices get heard and that ultimately, whatever decisions are made, it's always about what is helpful for the, for the client. So navigating that within um, the ward round, because um, again, that's a, a kind of made up of a multidisciplinary team and very, you know, mainly nurses and the consultant psychiatrists. And I think you get OT input as well and very much led by the consultant for that ward. And slightly different to the community setting because they have, it's an acute psychiatric ward. So you're really dealing with people who are quite unwell or at the different stages of wellness. So you might have them come in extremely unwell and they use a lot of, they use medication to often stabilize that. Then they might think about introducing psychology or making a referral. Or I might think it might be um, um, beneficial to the client to have a psychologist involvement pretty early on. And sometimes that can be for the period that they're with it, it, you know, in an inpatient setting and it doesn't follow through to the community. I suppose the way I work, I'm definitely led by what the client wants. And sometimes that can be at odds with what the MDT think is best for the client. So very much I'm advocating on behalf of what the client wants. And it's important that their voice is heard. Um, but I, I feel that um, if I can, you know, um, you know, get their voice to be heard, then therefore my voice is being heard, you know, and some learning about psychology or psychology perspectives 
or being more um, thinking about the subjective experience of the, the client is something that's really kind of gets across, you know, because we reflect and we use reflective practice as a way of understanding ourselves, our work, the client, each other, and not all um, colleagues or professional groups use that. So that often is an aspiration and sometimes it, um, they, they go to their default position is to look at what is the obvious. And sometimes by delving in a little bit deeper and, and being a little bit more, um, just a bit more thoughtful and a bit more aware and a bit more um, quiet. Because I, I find that in MDT meetings, it's really noisy. Everyone's trying to get in their point of view and people don't necessarily sit with things long enough to think, well, is this helpful, is this not? How does that make me feel? What could be going on for the client? What's going on for me when I'm talking about it from this perspective? So there's a lot of that trying to bring people back and slow people down, which in a busy CMHT is at odds with really how they sometimes work, but yeah. So, so those are some of the challenges, but it's, it's also interesting as well. When I joined as a member of this group, I, what was great for me was that there was a group within the division that focused on issues concerning race and culture. As the group has gone on and we've, you know, I've attended meetings and been part of um, different um, collaborations, like there was a kind of joint conference um, on race and culture um, um, a, a couple of years ago now. Um, the last few, a couple of years we've been doing some writing on race, culture and diversity. And though that publication has had a, a very um, up and down journey through the, the um, process of trying to get it published within the BPS, we're now at the point where we are um, preparing for it to be published within the next month or so and hopefully have um, that launched um, maybe at the, the conference this year and sending it out to members. And we're doing that for the membership, really to generate debate about this issue. And you know, it's very topical, not just within society, but within um, the division, and I suppose within the BPS. Um, I suppose the challenges within the BPS, from my perspective, is that there, there isn't much um, diverse leadership within the BPS. And um, recently, I submitted um, an article to the psychologists actually asking that question. Where is the diversity within the BPS? My writing was quite challenging, um, but thoughtful. But if you don't bring these things out, nothing changes. People stop talking about it and we just stagnate and everything just remains the same. So hopefully, if it's accepted in the, in the psychologists to be published online, then I hope that will generate some debate. Also, I'm leading with um, a few others, well, contributors of a leadership and diversity booklet, which I hope to um, bring that together. And that's a cross-divisional perspective of leadership and diversity. And that's really an exciting thing for the Division of Counseling Psychology to be leading on. One of the things that I'm really interested in is, is writing. Um, and I suppose when I think of all the uh, writers, authors that have inspired me and think about how excellent their writing is, I think to myself, could I ever do it as, as well as that? And when, I, when I've thought about that, that's actually rather off-putting when I compare myself to people who are really um, excellent. And I suppose we all have um, something within us that we want to say and we can say that verbally or we can do it in the written word. Whatever the hesitation um, that there was in me in the past in doing this, I found that when I've been invited to write something, once I get into it, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy doing the research on that topic, 
bringing it all together. It's not easy. Like, like last year, for instance, um, I was invited with a colleague of mine, Dr. Huck, to um, co-author a chapter on older people. It was entitled um, Professional and Ethical Issues in Working with Older Adults. And it's part of a handbook on professional and ethical practice edited by um, Tribe and Rachel Tribe and, um, and Morrissey. And um, that was launched last year. But the process in doing that, in writing something, sending it back to the editors, having that then reflect on what you've written and um, ask you to add bits or take out bits and what, what, whatever, it's, it's part of the learning. And I've found that that's helped improve my writing. So that was one thing that I, I took part in. Then um, late last year, November last year, we were asked to um, co-author another chapter on common mental health issues within older people. And that's part of a, a book on anti-discriminatory practice in mental health for older people. And that's due to be um, published this year. So I find that, you know, it's, it, yes, it does take work. It does take time. It takes you, um, so as well as my clinical practice, which is a full-time job, the chair role, which is a full-time job, <laughs> and, um, and the writing, what I'm trying to do is, um, you know, really develop my creativity, my range of skills, the breadth of what... Um, is, is possible because that's how I grow as an individual and if that in inspires, encourages any counselling psychologist to do that, I want to encourage you to do that.